This episode of the Kill by Kill podcast is brought to you by Stephen King and Richard Chismar's electrifying new audiobook, Wendy's Final Task. Visit stephenkingaudio.com to learn more about this final installment of the New York Times bestselling Wendy's Button Box Trilogy. Return to Castle Rock today and download Wendy's Final Task wherever audiobooks are sold or visit stephenkingaudio.com to learn more. Hey, even better, you can get your own copies of Gwendy's Button Box Trilogy. Now that's all three audiobooks just by emailing us at killbykillpod at gmail.com with Gwendy in the subject line. Do it today, people. And now the body count continues. about Final Destination on Kill by Kill. Well, greetings and salutations, and your old pal Patrick Hampton. Coming to you once again from somewhere in the tri-state area, this is the Kill by Kill podcast where we're dedicated to celebrating the least discussed component of any horror film, the characters. Now, we're going to unpack all the glorious details of the second half of uh, Final Destination in the hopes that a high school student's untimely end is just the beginning of the jokes that we might make at their expense. And as always... There is only one person I trust that if I need to get out of a car that uh, I've parked in front of a moving train, um, she'll at least, you know, grab me underneath the armpit and give it the old one, two, try the one, the only Gina Radcliffe. How are you doing today, Gina? Uh, I'm good. Uh, I mean, we did talk about, we have talked about crazy mom strength in the past. <laughs> we have and talked now, about crazy mom Now, granted, I'm not your mother. That True, would be yes. very weird. Right. Um, but but I you am, are the mother of this podcast. I am a mother. <laughs> True. So I, I think that can apply to uh, other people in, in very stressful, high danger situations. Yeah, because we've all been there in New York State. We're about to be run over by a Canadian train. You know, these things happen all the time. But uh, I don't want to alarm you or scare you, Gina. Uh, we are not alone. That is right. We have a special guest. You may know her as a writer over at Dread Central or as one half of Nightmare on Fierce Street, the one, the only, Sheree Bohannon. How are you doing today, Sheree? I'm doing great. Thanks for having me. I'm so happy to have you here. This has been a long time coming. Wanted to have you on for a while. I'm a terrible producer. It takes (laughs) me a while to do things. No one's accused me of being a great producer on this show yet. And nor should they, but I'm happy you are here now. And I'm happy you are here for this particular motion picture. Uh, Sheree, when was the first time you actually watched Final Destination? I was definitely a tween and my youngest older brother would like pick us up so we could spend the night over at his house and show Mm -hmm. us scary movies. Oh, okay. I was into the scary movies. (laughs) (laughs) Wait a second. You're a horror podcaster who has been into scary movies for a while. All right. (laughs) Well, Right. Fuck fuck what I know. This is a whole new world. Okay, go for it. But okay. Super original story. (laughs) Um, (laughs) But he was like, you got to see this one because I, I never seen anything like this one because Mm -hmm. like you don't normally have to run from fate when you're ready from like, these typical people and monsters in the horror movies. And so I was like, and I like spent the whole weekend watching it while the other kids played. And he was like, you can, (laughs) you, you want to borrow the DVD? I'm like, yeah, but also I got to watch it one more time. (laughs) (laughs) Now this DVD had an interesting component to it. Uh, First off, it was in one of those uh, cardboard with a plastic uh, clip at the end of it. Uh, DVD cases that New Line loved so much were fucking terrible. But there was a special feature on it that you would uh, press the the button and it would, a clock would start going and it would predict when you were going to die. Yep. It predicted I was going to die in 2018. And the thing is, this is either a dream I'm, I'm having after having died in 2018. Very vivid, very long. 
or I have defied death and therefore cannot be killed, Gina. I'm a god. Well, I or or you know other people around you are going to die in a in a variety of very strange and occasionally amusing ways, and <laughs> you know as as the wrong writes itself and makes its way back to you. That's true. It could 180 on me, as uh, the original title of this motion picture was Flight 180, and they make a shit ton of references to it, and then they just change the name to something. I'll be honest with you, as a person who names things professionally, uh, it's something a little bit better. But there's a lot of 180 uh, happening in this motion picture. Before we get going, uh, we should probably let our audience know who's still left alive in this portion of the motion picture. Um, compared to the usual body count uh, and the body count of volume one in particular, Almost no one is left alive. There's so many people died in the first half of this movie that uh, everything after seems like uh, tiddlywinks, to be honest with you. Yeah, we're, course- we're, we're, we're down about 10, down about 10% of the original cast. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Uh, just a, a whole plane full of people died, and usually that's not the way our movies start. But so here we go. Uh, we're going to start with Alex Browning, our final girl, as it were. Um, what happened? Uh, and Alex is what happens to be wearing XXXL clothing. Um, everything he has on appears to be from the tent <laughs> store. Well, the last episode, I think we determined that that, that maybe this part was meant to be played by Kevin Smith originally. <laughs> Well, that's, that is, in fact, Billy Hitchcock. Um, and uh, Billy Hitchcock, he's heading to the store on his bike. Do you need anything? Because that's where he'll be, heading to the store <laughs> on his bike. Wearing I, jorts. I, I also thought it was weird. His clothes were so oversized. What, like, yeah. the other men in the cast were wearing, like, fitted things. Like, Kurt Smith is in a T-shirt that's showing off every gym day he ever had. <laughs> right. <laughs> And babyface Devin Sawa is like swimming in his clothes. And I was like, what yes. happened? He's a tiny twig man who was given his father's clothing closet to uh, use for this motion picture. <laughs> it, I mean, yes, at the time in that late 90s, early 2000s, men were swimming in their clothes. But this is, is just out of normal. Just how, I guess it seemed normal to me at the time but uh, the more time passes the odd it, the odder it looks whereas carter horton um he is like a ben affleck in the streets and a sad ben affleck in the sheets <laughs> yeah he's a uh, he's he's glowering he's he's, very he's kind glowery. of he's glowering in a, in a very you know, you know handsome way Yes. I, this was around the time of the Dawson's Creek era. And so I was very much about Kurt Smith. Yeah, sure. Yeah, he's a handsome dude. Right. And it was the first time he's played an asshole, as far as I was aware at the time. Because normally he's Kurt Smith, super sensitive, listening, (laughs) should be the romantic lead, but is not. And here he's like, I'm going to try and like kill everybody if I might be next. Like, what are you doing, good sir? Why are you not making sense? (laughs) Yeah, for whatever reason, he's dressed like he's out of Southie. Uh, and it, like he's a gearhead and he's w- wearing thick gold chains. and It's just an odd sort of thing. I guess they're, they're trying to differentiate him uh, from the Todd's and the Billy's and the Alex's of this motion picture. But uh, it also seems like dress up clothes. It, um, felt, it felt like it was his audition for Christine. <laughs> sure. Yes. <laughs> Oh, he would would have been great in a Christine. Um, yeah, well, yeah, I can see him knifing some yogurt and uh, <laughs> making, uh, you know, threatening people in a garage. He would have been fantastic at that. Uh, then, of course, we have the wonderfully named Clear Rivers, uh, a midriff that will live in infamy. There's just <laughs> so much of her stomach that's. I don't know, state mandated to be seen in every single scene. None of her shirts seem to reach below like the bottom of her rib cage. It's just it, every shirt ends there. <laughs> I feel like her shirt and her bangs were going through something and we never got the full story. <laughs> oh, <laughs> I mean, we get one of her stories, but we don't get nearly enough of her stories. It's uh, she is the one character who is allowed to say something about their past. 
and, and of course we'll get there, but so one of the reasons we picked, you know, Final Destination is that it kind of fits that slasher definition of a bunch of characters who you know are all going to die, and all the actors are like, how do I make how do I make a character out of this? What <laughs> what choices are am, am I going to make that that's going to make me pop in this motion picture? And some of those choices are I'm going to be Ben Affleck. Don't mind me. I'm over here Afflecking it up. And some of it's like, no, I worked for these abs and I'm going to show them off. God damn it. <laughs> I, her, I, when we get to her story, I have so many other questions and follow-ups that were never answered <laughs> because yes, table, table them for now, but they are coming. We, we are going to get into that story. Uh, and of course, uh, rounding out our survivors uh, is Valerie Luton, which is a very subtle reference. <laughs> very subtle. So, yeah. so you know, I, I I had to look it up to be. What does this mean? I don't. This seems like it means something. Yeah. Uh, who, who can possibly say? Look out for queer quadrant later on. The, I, well, it might have come in out come out at this point where we talk about both cat people, the original cat people, and the eighty two cat people. Uh, <laughs> We'll talk infinitely about Val Luton there. Um, so uh, we start with what we know teens were into in 1999, Alka-Seltzer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was that was not a, uh, a hangover cure of choice or you know whatever they were taking it for. I just, yeah, I don't, if, I don't know if it's, I guess you need to settle your stomach after you see someone pancake into a bus. Is that <laughs> what's being implied here? <laughs> oh boy. Uh, I just like, I guess I, I've just never gotten any satisfaction from Alka-Seltzer. So when I see it being used, I'm like, you're being snowed. Like someone told you that would work. Uh-uh. But of course, a lot of things happened in the late 90s. Like, we were all supposed to die in Y2K. And then when we didn't, everything went insane. <laughs> like, if I had a dollar for every apocalypse that was supposed to happen in my lifetime, <laughs> I could retire. And I would also be Buffy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we all live on the Hellmouth now. Uh, I have to say that the TV news graphics here are much better than anything we saw on any of the Friday the 13th, Gina. Uh, oh, yeah, the, yeah, I would agree with you there. <laughs> I mean, you compare this to parts three or four and when they're announcing, like, bloodbath, and, you know, along the lake, and this is, like, ooh, top-notch here. But uh, let's return to the action after we've calmed ourselves down uh, to Ms. Valerie Luton's house. Uh, and apparently she's a member of the creepy doll of the month club. Well, you know, what are you going to do with that, that, the ample teacher salary she's earning? <laughs> um, she, whatever that very large jawed doll is sitting in the middle of her living room. Now, granted, she is packing to leave town, but she should consider putting that in the basement, wrapping it in newspaper and rubber bands and just getting out of Dodge because it's not helping. I was just gonna say, just launching it into the nearest river. Yeah. I also wanted to know where what where they were located because her house was pretty huge for a teacher's salary. Yeah, I mean, she does say like she's been there her entire life, so it's entirely possible maybe this is a house she's inherited, uh, a family house perhaps. I, I don't know what her parents or relatives did that they needed a stained glass dagger in their <laughs> front door, but it's saying a lot. Well, you know, I, I, I like that the camera kind of holds on it very meaningfully. Like, <laughs> you know, get ready for one of these. <laughs> <laughs> well, as you often say, Gina, it's one of those close encounter of the third kinds sculpting the mashed potatoes and saying, <laughs> this means something. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, Alex is creeping outside of a teacher's home, you know, like a normal boy with nothing to hide. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely unsuspicious. No. Just trying to help. Yeah. I mean, I will grant you that Alex's track record of people dying around him is staggering. But yeah, you know, like he's like the Jordan of being around people just before they die at this point. Uh it's undisputed. Uh, <laughs> but it's still odd that when you catch him outside your house, you call the fucking FBI. 
Yeah, I, the whole FBI thing, I mean, at least they, it doesn't, you know, it's not very long after this point where they finally say, we know you didn't blow up that plane. Yeah. <laughs> and it's like, okay, what is he doing wrong here except being kind of a weirdo? I, he's a weirdo on the loose. And apparently that's when you alert the authorities and they comes a running for you, no matter what you're doing. But also when they catch him and he's like, I was checking the air in this tire. Also super sus. <laughs> <laughs> like that is a, that there are very few excuses that would have gotten out of him out of that particular trouble, but I'm judging the air in this tire with my hands. Like, no, Come, well, we got well, a holding <laughs> tank with your name on it, pal. I mean, the other, the other cop, the one that's not Daniel Roebuck, um, yeah. he, he's just looking at him like, I right, just give me an excuse to shoot you, man. <laughs> <laughs> I would love to kill you right here and now. Yeah, last episode I referred to him as our second most popular Shrek, but I'm going to reduce him down to fifth after this <laughs> end of the movie. He does not, he does not uh, come off as very sensitive. Although he, I well, do then feel later, bad. Then later he 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 says that he actually he's like he's like well I almost believe was like oh okay you're scared of him yeah. because you're not acting like you're scared of him. No, he's not. <laughs> <laughs> he's acting like if he moves his face too much, he's going to be removed from the set. And I like, I think they were, he was going for a specific type of FBI agent. It just comes off weird. Whereas Daniel Roebuck is just Daniel Roebucking it up, um, which I'm all for knock on wood for that fella. Cause he's on a movie set with, with people who are just deciding to just knife their own reputations straight open every other day on Twitter. It's real smart. <laughs> Holy fuck. The times we live in. Okay. Inside we see that Miss Luton is falling apart. Like she obviously is an actress who can bring a lot to the table. She's been that we said in the last episode, like, you know exactly the kind of person Val Luton, Valerie Luton is, <laughs> uh, which he tells, you know, a guy handing out pamphlets in the airport to fuck off. <laughs> like there's, there's an internal light that seems to just shine through in this. But on the other half, we have since the, the uh, explosion of the aircraft have watched her crumble and crumble and crumble and crumble in real time. And here's like a master class of someone who obviously this is being shot over what, like half a week to try to get every single piece of this accomplished. And you have to be on edge for all of that. It's kind of like, why, why the fuck isn't this woman working more? God damn it. I find her character <laughs> interesting because like, she definitely had that guilt in that first half where she was like, I sent him back on the plane. And then she's like, I'm getting fucking out of town. I'm afraid of Alex. <laughs> and I just, I wanted more from her character because she seemed to be the one that was making sense. Yes. She's at least allowed the opportunity to basically have survivor's guilt. Say those things out loud. You know she's experiencing deeper emotions. Whereas everyone else is kind of left with bluster and or Billy Hitchcock, who's like, I don't know, I'm th I think I'm going to eat my way through this problem. Let's <laughs> I'm going to go to the store. Does anyone need anything from the store? I'm going to bike to the store and I'm going to get some Oreos and that's going to solve all my problems. I mean, honestly, I get it. I get it. <laughs> I <laughs> No, I do. <laughs> I too want to bike to the store and eat my I way. Mean, through if I mean, if I survived a plane crash, I would be like, you know what? I'm just going to be sitting here trying not to think about this by you tear it in this pack to Oreo cookies. <laughs> Get me a hoagie stat. That's what I need right the, now. The, the crunching will keep the sounds in my brain. It's the, the, they will muffle <laughs> the sounds in my head. <laughs> um, what is your last meal, Gina? By like, like, are we talking if I died right now? Yeah. Like if you knew, like you had a little clock in your tummy. Um, oh, like what meal would I would I select? Uh, yeah. Oh my gosh. Um, 
I mean, I would love to say like, you know, something like you, know, the finest sushi and, you know, mm-hmm. but it, it, it's probably like a filet of fish or something. Just, <laughs> just, just, just give me, just, just give me something. I'm just going to like ride into hell with a filet of fish in one hand, a breakfast burrito in the other. <laughs> just, just do a slim pick and <laughs> I think that may be the most honest answer anyone has ever given in the nearly six years we've been on the air, Gina. <laughs> Uh, Sheree, what, what, what do you say? Like, what, what's the thing you're going to ride out in a, a blaze of glory on? Oh, I'm going for the best lamb chop that I will ever have. It needs to be the mm-hmm. best one. It's my last one. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm not going to waste too much time with sides. <laughs> Cause okay. I just, just give me the <laughs> whole lamb. Grab a bone and go to town. <laughs> yes. <laughs> with a pile of mode. <laughs> yes. Um, <laughs> give me all the lamb in a pile of mode. Cause like, <laughs> I don't have time <laughs> for vegetables. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I guess I am right there with you to a degree. I'm really thinking of what exactly that would be. I had a tacos Doritos, you know, that sort of crispy rolled taco. Yes. Um, a couple months back that I'm still thinking about. I would either go in that direction or there's a place in Pasadena uh, that makes a really good burger, and I might I might go that route, but uh, yeah, I, no, I'm not. No, I'm not having like, uh, please, a side salad. That's not happening. <laughs> no. Could you could you replace that that ranch with some oil and vinegar? I'm trying to watch my weight. <laughs> I want to go. I want to go. I want to. I want him go easy on the on on the mortician when he has to, you know, yeah. prepare my body. <laughs> Yeah, well, not all of us are going to get that jigsaw, you know, shot of right up our taint. Uh, we don't have to worry <laughs> about how we're going to appear as a corpse, whereas he very much did. You know, I just want I just want them to, like, you know, slice me up and be like, Jesus, no wonder she died. <laughs> There's no. an entire filet of fish lodged in her throat. <laughs> the amount of cheese I'll be pulling out of my arteries is no one's fault but my own. <laughs> It's going to attach like a, a fondue fountain to you. That's, like, <laughs> you know, that's how they'll, that's how they'll lay you out at, at your wake. It's like a oh, fun. <laughs> <laughs> no, I do not want a radish to dip in this. I'm dead. <laughs> <laughs> Please a chicken and a biscuit me. Thank you. <laughs> um, so Luton's death venture, as it were, or the, the, the crazy confluence of events that end up with her dead. Wait, wait, Start wait. With, I had to, to ask, oh, yeah. what does she pour in her cup? Is that ever clear? Because <laughs> okay. that well, stuff is lighting up. Well, it's vodka, um, which, I mean, is of the higher proofs alcohols for some. I mean, it depends on what you're buying. She does not look like she's buying premium vodka. This is definitely like what you're local bodega has vodka like because because it's like it's, it's isn't cre- dusty it's creating like a trail of fire like like a wily e. coyote cartoon <laughs> i imagine on a teacher's salary it's probably <laughs> motor oil <laughs> <laughs> it, it's just straight it's just straight turpentine in a cup <laughs> cup yes and <laughs> It is like straight out of uh, some, uh, you know, hillbillies distillery. That's how <laughs> close it is. It's like it, it, it was not a potato that long ago. Let's put it that way. <laughs> I also love how whoever was in charge of like the dripping of the cup, they mm-hmm. overdid it. Cause like, I'm like, this is a lot of drippage. She would notice this. <laughs> like, she the would cup would be it. empty. <laughs> like, yes. I just don't think you can have that leak. Like it would drop on your shoes. You'd be walking through it. You would hear that. Yeah. <laughs> and your cup would be, if there was more liquid on the computer than in her cup. And I was like, <laughs> yes. who shut up to work today? <laughs> like, <I did> this. <laughs> Plus it's one of those old school. What was that computer company that had cows as. Uh, oh, as Dell? Their, Dell. Dell, right? Yeah. Yeah. Or a gateway. Was gateway. It, yeah, one right, of those. Yeah, you're right. They you're all right. ate yeah. one another. Yeah. <laughs> all, the, all the all the big white computer companies all ate one another, and now there's something completely different. It was a computer centipede situation. They right. just got <laughs> the wilder part for me is the whole I'm putting hot tea in this cup, and then I look at the logo and go ah, and throw it. 
That is the weirder part. And then she does, she's like, get yourself together. Put cold vodka in this cup. Just straight ass vodka. Straight ass vodka. I mean, she pulls out ice cubes, but we never see her apply the ice cubes necessarily. It just looks like, fuck it. Get the coldest vodka I have. Put it in this hot ass mug. It it splits open. She never notices. She looks over. Before that, she puts a, a, a tea towel over her knife block. That will come <laughs> into play later. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, but then the explosion in the monitor ends up from the sparking of the vodka, uh, shatters the monitor and sends a piece of glass directly into her throat, which she yanks out and just starts bleeding everywhere. Then she starts slipping on her own blood, which we all know after many years here on this podcast, blood is slippery. So that is a thing out there. But usually you just end up with kind of a hunky guy on the floor and then he wakes up in the in the ambulance next to you. Uh, she's having a much harder time because she, she, uh, the sparking from the computer lights the vodka on fire, which again, like Gina said, follows her like a, <laughs> like a cartoon character. <laughs> like there's a, a sizzling line of, of uh, gunpowder behind her and ends up exploding the stovetop and the bottle of vodka just blows up. <laughs> Sends her rocketing to the floor and then, a, a knife falls out of the, the, the block and just sinks into her sternum. Then Alex shows up. Great timing. <laughs> and he's like, how can I make this better? And the oven explodes and it sends a chair, which I'm not oh sure God. how this works. <laughs> then the chair falls over and sinks the knife deeper into her chest. You know, that would, that would absolutely happen to me. <laughs> <laughs> Life feels like we're living in Val Luton's kitchen. You know, Don't like, you I, I'd be like, I, I, I might survive. Until, oh, oh, I'm dead. oh, no, no. <laughs> nope. Some Never guy mind. with a podcast is convincing people not to take a free and available fucking vaccine. That that's what that's the oven exploding. This huh. fuck knuckle that I liked on news radio is now causing the pandemic over and over and over and over again because idiots listen to him. I knew oh, I knew he was going to be an issue when Fear Factor happened, and I was like, <laughs> mm, he does not seem like the type of person I would like to have a drink with. <laughs> No, I don't trust him to put cockroaches on me. I also don't trust his medical advice. This racist fuck. Anyway. Oh, they had to yeah. remove 70 episodes. 70 episodes <laughs> is worth. That's how many they had caught. Like, who oh, knows how many more? It's, it's up to 110 now. Well, okay, great. Yeah. You know, we've all had a slip of a tongue and had to erase 110 fucking episodes of our podcast. Jesus Christ. This is the darkest timeline. Oh my God, we're all in Valerie Luton's kitchen. <laughs> and Alex shows up and he's like, how can I help you? And the oven explodes and a chair lands on the knife. And then he's like, I'm going to grab that knife. Now, I'm hmm. ah! like, we should be showing the Youth of America Columbo episodes, right? Because here, Columbo episodes show people trying to get away with murder. And these are the upper, the highest of class of LA where the elite meet to knock somebody off. And they send in Columbo who's like, well, I know you're guilty. And sooner or later, you're going to do something so fucking stupid. I'm going to know it. Children need to see this and understand you're not going to get away with murder. Don't touch the fucking knife. Just don't, don't check people's air in their tires with your hands. Don't do it. And then he runs out of the house in front of Billy Hitchcock and why Billy Hitchcock is there. I don't know. It's his fifth trip to the store that day. And he just happens to be there to watch that entire house fucking explode. And he looks, he looks mildly confused at this. <laughs> <laughs> to be fair, he looked mildly confused the whole movie. <laughs> that's true. Yeah, that's just I, his. That's just his character arc. Is he's confused. Now, he's confused. He doesn't know how air works. He doesn't know how to talk to girls. Like what he knows is the route from his house to the store and back again on his bicycle. <laughs> <laughs> 
I knew I didn't know about his character when at the funeral he showed up in like a sweater and everybody else was there in like suits and like button downs. And he was like, no, I'm living my best about to go to college life. Yeah, I, he's he lives in comfort. He's a comfort king. <laughs> we have to respect <laughs> it. He just likes a flowing ashram of hockey jerseys and oversized sweaters. This is just how Billy lives his life. We just have to accept this is who he is. Um, but yeah, uh, R.I.P.D. to Valerie Luton. You were a real one. Um, <laughs> you went through hell. I think she gets it worse than anyone else in this entire movie. But I think the success of the entire franchise can be traced back to the bus death and mm-hmm. Valerie Luton's kitchen. Because those are the sequences that work the best right in the middle of the movie and cement the franchise's reputation. I mean, I think that ultimately Todd's death is probably a little more like prolonged. Yeah. But yes. Val- Valerie's is, uh, is you know, the, kind of the our, the, our, the, our guests we had on the first half, you described as a, a Rube Goldberg style death. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Where, you know, they would, they would lean way more into that in the, in the other movies in the franchise. Mm-hmm. Whereas this one was more generally, you know, you know, up oh, here comes a buster from out of nowhere. Here comes a, you know, <laughs> piece of metal taking the top of your head off from right out of nowhere. Yeah. So, but 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 this one you know, kind of has that whole every everything just kind of falls into place in a you know w- weird and un and, and unlikely way. Yeah. yeah, it's a circuitous route. It's that that you don't see where all the puzzle pieces fit, and then they just start fitting together, and all of a sudden, then you have a picture of a murder, and that I think becomes more fun as the series progresses. Whereas some films, you know, are centered around big gore effects and some films are centered around, uh, you know, thriller style chases here, that Rube Goldberg aspect of it and the sudden death out of nowhere aspect. You make that sandwich and you put hot teens in the middle of it. Although we might reach a sequence in which we're not dealing with hot teens, we are dealing with hot young adults. And then we're back to Friday the 13th, which everyone thinks are teens, but doesn't have any certifiable teens until Friday the 13th Part 8. I'm going to say it again. I'm going to keep saying it until someone fucking listens. I I did not. I was so confused as a child. I watched a lot of horror movies and they all look like 30 year olds. And I was like, am I supposed to look 30 when I'm 16? And I was just very confused about it all. (laughs) Yeah. Well, it is kind of confusing because some movies really go out of their way to tell you, like, prom night. These <laughs> people are in high school, and you're like, no, no, they're not. None of those people look like they're in high school. They None of them look young. Um, whereas Friday the 13th, I think they made a differentiation point where they're like, no, 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 we'll do, like, older people because it'll seem like they're a bit more responsible, and it turns out they're not. And that was their like how will be different element of it. But everyone puts it in, in a big bowl and labels it slasher and everyone keeps pulling out teens out of it. It's like not every slasher is a teen slasher. Don't, 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 don't get it twisted. Okay. So we've been down the philosophical route. Uh, let's talk about Carter, um, who tries to carve uh, his girlfriend's name into a stone statue with a pocket knife. So that's what we're dealing with here. At least he's pretty. Oh, oh yeah. No, he's a slab of grade A beef, but there's nothing upstairs here. And it really, really begins to show. But Carter, Billy, and Clear meet up uh, because they're going to talk to Alex under the belief that he knows who's next. But of course, Alex is on the run from the FBI for putting himself in harm's way to try to save somebody's life. But it's such a stupid fucking story. They would lock him away immediately. So they go off and then we learn that Alex is uh, hanging out by the beaches of. Uh, that's, that's Jones beach. And I, I, I'll tell you something about Jones beach. Do you know okay. who I saw at Jones beach? No, who? Nine Inch Nails. It comes all the way back again to, to the, the many mentions of Nine Inch Nails in our last episode. <laughs> this movie is so Nine Inch Nails. And you never really realize it. 
It's so many, all coming back. So there. many Nine Inch Nails connections. I'm just standing here at my serial killer board, just finding all the <laughs> Nine Inch Nails connections. Just instead of Pepe Silva, it's just Nine Inch Nails everywhere. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> Just red string going from red string. Now, was that a, a a proper Nine Inch Nails concert, or was that part of a concert package? That was a that was a proper Nine Inch Nails concert. Oh. I thought you were going to ask me, like, you know, did I just see them like laying out on the beach or something? Just <laughs> yeah, just do, just 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 dudes having fun. I mean, <laughs> well, first of all, there's a band I associate with just dudes having fun. <laughs> Secondly, I have seen them enough to know. That's not a crew that sees a lot of sunlight. You know what I mean? No. Like they're in my category where they're like a fork on a microwave. It's just sparks and pain whenever they meet the sun. <laughs> so, yeah, I'm assuming that was a concert. It was a concert. Yes. Yeah. Um, so clear sends uh, Billy and Carter off to measure their dicks somewhere else and decides to have a beachside backstory sesh where she unloads why she lives alone in a house by herself. And it turns out that her dad was shot uh, when someone was robbing a convenience store and he was inside getting cigarettes. Then his, then her mom got remarried to a guy who didn't want children. So she was shipped off to where she lives now by herself. And I, I don't know how that works, but okay. But this story is very maudlin and semi-believable. I'm not sure the way she tells it is believable, but there's that. So I was never a fan of Allie Larder, even though she kept turning up in things I watched, like Heroes. Um, mm-hmm. I, I was, yeah. She was never my Allie favorite. Allie Larder and Heroes. Talk, talk oh. about episodes that need to be erased <laughs> after all this time. Uh, just, just. Just internet look up Allie Larder and Heroes and hear the stories that her castmates have to tell about her on the set. Please do go on. Specifically Leonard Roberts, who wrote the essay outing her and all of her nonsense. Yes. She's not my favorite Allie. I have other Allies that I enjoy. There were other <laughs> there were other blondes that came out of this era that I believe have a greater worth than uh, Allie Larder. I, I was not surprised that she wasn't, um, you know, thought of fondly and that her behavior was shitty. I guess, you know what? I'm not, I'm not even thinking of an Allie. I'm thinking of Amy Smart. Where is oh, Amy yeah. Smart? She was good. She was a good actress. Oh God. It just makes me angry. Uh, and here she's just, I don't know. It's kind of one note. Like, they're trying to give her a character instead of just making her this, you know, hot welding lady, <laughs> which is what her, who reads three books at once, you know, and has everyone, her own every home. high school had one of those. <laughs> she, she's a high schooler with her own home, a full home, like multiple floors and a dog. And I'm yes. just like, um, you're 16. Yeah. <laughs> what? Why do you have a dog chained up outside? Who is your legal guardian? Uh, how does she afford fuel for a welding tank? I don't know. These are questions we are never answered. And we just still, know she's got a bad backstory. And still has access to the father's cabin, which nobody sold after all these years. <laughs> no, I don't know. I don't know. Concerns. Concerns. Uh, <laughs> they're, they're legit. 100%. Uh, but after this... She begins to refer to Alex as baby. And uh, are they fucking? Or did they fuck on that beach? Have they been fucking? Did they fuck before this? No, Do you I mean, refer I think to anyone that, as baby unless you are having penetrative sex? Well, I mean, I, I people think names all the time. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> you know, I mean, I, I call platonic friends cupcake, sweetie. You know, I mean... <laughs> Well, you're a known sexual harasser, Gina. That's, I'm I'm a total I'm a total sex pest. I, I need to be stopped <laughs> immediately. I don't know why I have not been maced over and over and over again, frankly. <laughs> but um I mean I I thought that she'd be the whole oh well this is how you make me feel. I mean I, I thought that, that established that she has a she has a crush on him. Yeah. I mean, maybe but, she figured telling him this story kind of brought them closer together. I don't I don't 
think they, I didn't get the impression that they'd had sex. It was yeah. very streamlined because it was the year 2000. And so you had to be like, there's a hetero guy and a hetero girl. They got to be together. Yeah. <laughs> Even though no, they the, have to find some other, they have to find each other attractive. Otherwise, how will we know? How will there be a movie? And yeah. so like immediately it's like, oh, they're going to have to be the couple. But they never had like couple moments. It was more like, I believe you, I think. And then she <laughs> ratted him out to the fucking FBI. And I was like, <laughs> um, <laughs> Yeah, it's um we have we when we started going through the scream movies, we found a phenomenon <laughs> within them called have you considered my penis? And that is where a boyfriend is like, well, uh I think I could help you with all your problems and the way to do it is I don't know, maybe have you considered my penis? And here we almost have the reverse of that of the have you considered my vagina? But <laughs> it doesn't go all the way there. So, I don't know, that's, it, it's either a clever reversal on Scream or they just cut a bunch of shit out. Well, we may never know. Yeah, we're facing death. How about we hook up? You know, how about I <laughs> think about every regret I've made in my life up to this very, very moment? <laughs> Speaking what if of I, need, I mean, I realize you don't have parents to say goodbye to, Claire, but I would like to say goodbye to my parents. <laughs> But we never see them again. So, no, I don't think he does want to say goodbye to his parents. He he says to his dad, you've been very helpful. And then we never see those fuckers again. They're out. I, that was one of my questions. Because they definitely all show up and be like, oh, no, my kid survived. And it's like, mm, the funeral's over. Y'all are on y'all's own again. <laughs> Just like- we don't. We don't deal with this. This is this. You need to you need to move out of our house, right? <laughs> um, so Billy's character is given the arduous task of stating out loud why the FBI are interested in Alex, and part of it is that according to him, the the fire was so hot inside the house it caramelized her blood. <laughs> is that something that happens? I I don't think so. It was the word choice for me because when I think caramelized, I think onions. I think <laughs> yeah. Food well, also, Billy's not going to know what the word caramelized means, yeah. right? <laughs> well, it depends on what he's picking up at the store. We don't <laughs> we don't know. It's all snack foods. Maybe he's going to the store to pick up some A five Wagyu and just <laughs> you know because you once you put that light sear on it, you don't have to cook it all the way through. You're going to take out the texture. It's already tender, Gina. <laughs> Like the word choice always sends me because I it, it just always does. I'm like you can say anything. You could just be like they found footprints and leave it vague, but it's like yeah. no, it was caramelized. And I was like, oh caramelized. no, don't say that word. <laughs> like, it, 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 also, caramelized is like something that happens to the fats within a piece of food when it meets fire, and that also means like her blood was fatty enough to caramelize. <laughs> I don't know. I, I just think that's a w- really weird, interesting, but not f- word choice. I don't know. It's Speaking a post mortem of- read. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's like, oh, she had high cholesterol. <laughs> <It was> like, <laughs> caramelizing her blood on the kitchen floor. <laughs> she really should have watched her saturated fats. One too many burger. Um, uh, Carter then uses the phrase warlock as a slur, and that's not cool, Gina. <laughs> We, we've met a warlock. Uh, if you go to our Patreon, we talk about warlock and how Megan Sunday, you know, that that was a formative thing for her. And here is Carter just using warlock like, like it's a bad thing. <laughs> I mean, if somebody called me a warlock, like, heck yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Better believe it. Yeah, I'm going to make some finger puppets and zap you. That's what I'm going to do. <laughs> Uh, but what it comes down to is that Carter, Carter's an asshole. Carter yes. does his own research. Carter thinks that vitamins are a way to outlive a virus. Carter has found some great guys on YouTube and TikTok, and what they say just makes sense to him. Oh, yeah, Carter would be a total Rogan fan. Oh, fuck, yeah. <laughs> he would. Yeah. He would, though. He would. Uh, it's gotten written all over him because... Like he, oh, he's so fucking angry about something. And I'm not, I'm not entirely sure what it is, but uh, he only gets angrier as the movie goes on. And this leads to him trying to 
tell death what's up? <laughs> I don't know. Like, you think you're in charge here, death? I am. And it's like, what the fuck are we chained up to? So this asshole goes rip roaring throughout this tiny, tiny ass town. He ends up parking on the fucking train tracks. So then he's like, I tell death what to do. And they're all yelling at him because they get out of the goddamn car because they're not fucking stupid. And like, get out of the car. He's like, okay. And his car won't start because of course it won't fucking start. You're on the goddamn train tracks. And then in flies Alex. And as we stated at the top, we've got some primo mommy strength happening here. Yeah. He just kind of rips them out of the car. (laughs) He, foresees that the belt has a tear in it but that is a uh, seat belts are 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 woven so even if they have small tears those tears tend to not expand because all the threads are are woven to, together in a mesh that's it's not how seat belts work that's not how fucking anything works the guy ha- we know that he has a fucking pocket knife why not just use the goddamn pocket knife gina <laughs> Jesus. It's not as exciting. <laughs> ah, I guess. So Alex pulls him out of the car. What we do learn from this incident is really awesome. And that is that Carter has peed his pants. <laughs> oh, I did not notice that really. Oh yeah. It's there. It's, it's one of my favorite details. <laughs> Carter has fully pissed his jeans. I mean, and... I, I get it. I would do that. <laughs> yeah. Yes, uh, it's a very, uh, you know, he really understands his place in the universe within that second, but not enough because the train destroys his beautiful car. Uh, and then a piece of ragged metal is just shaking underneath the train as it passes up until the point that um, the chain under the train stays mainly in the plane unless it catches that metal and sends it spinning out from underneath the train and through Billy's fucking head. He's decapitated above the jawline. Yeah, Yeah, that's, 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 that's that's pretty gnarly. It's pretty fucking wicked. It felt very personal. (laughs) Um, Yes. And it's right as Billy has, has, has begun to claim himself as a human being and know that he is not just someone who is, is worthless and just knows the, the best way to get to Seven Eleven on his bike. Like he's a person and he has this dawning realization and then um, it, it might stay in his head, but he doesn't think about it for all that long because it's unattached. <laughs> well, I mean, the whole, the whole point of this is basically death is out to get you. It has chosen yeah. you. It's mm-hmm. coming for you. And if someone gets in the way of that, death would be like, motherfucker, I'm killing someone tonight. <laughs> so if it's not going to be you, it's going to be someone standing right next to you. Yeah. Um, or, and the, this is the thing that the movie talks about a lot, uh, all this in this entire time, that the plan was to always kill Billy. And this entire misadventure is simply to, uh, you know, have him stand up while this train is passing and expose himself to loose metal decapitation. (laughs) Which is the sixth uh, biggest cause of character death in movies. Uh, Of course, number two right now is Peloton, having a heart attack on a Peloton. (laughs) Talk about a deserved death. Oh, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, and then we move on. So perhaps the funniest thing in this entire movie for me is that as Alex goes up to clear daddy's hus- uh, cabin, I don't know. There's, <laughs> there's a lot of owners. Um, he begins death proofing this cabin. And part of that is him duct taping loose baby dolls to the wall what are those baby dolls going to do to him gina i mean maybe he assumes you know death is so determined to kill someone that it'll just you know aim at the nearest you know humanoid figure it says (laughs) just launch a betsy wetsy down his throat no i meant like you know you know launch a stray knife at a doll or something just you know 
He yeah, it's like, oh, that's a person. Oh, he got me again. <laughs> Damn it. So he, he, they're basically crash test dumpings in, in this setup. Yeah, that's what you're, exactly. Yeah. Okay. Um, but the second funniest thing that happens is when he puts on work gloves to eat pudding. <laughs> Or is that deviled ham in a can? I could not decipher which it is. It was some sort I, of meaty substitute. Um, I, it was <laughs> gross. It was gross. Yeah, I, it's it's not something I want to eat straight out of the can. But I've always I always remembered it as pudding, and I just started writing it ahead. And then I looked while the movie was playing. I'm like, I don't think that's pudding. I think it's like the canned deviled ham that you get. Because of the how thick the wrapper is. It's very weird. I mean, what a final meal. <laughs> <laughs> what a way to go out. I was like, wouldn't it be afraid of choking on spam? I feel like that's the worst way to go out of anybody. <laughs> I guess he feels because it is a soft food that it will prevent him from choking on it. <laughs> um, I don't want to get into Alex's head. But maybe it's something he picked up as a tip from Penthouse Magazine. Penthouse Magazine readers... Call in. We know you're out there. Well, and all podcasts have are allow you to call in. Um, that's the second thing I learned from the Sex and the City reboot. I, I did okay. not know you were watching that. Um, I am in the bedroom when it's happening. What's happening is is my mind drifts elsewhere. <laughs> yes. It it hits a parachute and I I just glaze over and I start thinking about Friday the 13th characters. And then every <laughs> once in a while, something wakes me up. <laughs> Someone referring to a, a recorded comedy thing as a comedy concert over and over and over again. <laughs> How did this fucking become an, an <laughs> Sex and the City reboot podcast, Gina? I've gone insane. <laughs> we, we, we are well known for never, ever being able to stay on track with what exactly this podcast is about. <laughs> We really should have come up with a hard and fast concept that we stuck to. Um, that would have been helpful. Just be as dry and humorless as possible because <laughs> that's what you want to see applied to movies in which someone manages to strangle themselves on a clothesline. <laughs> <laughs> someone who drips straight vodka into a tube co uh, computer monitor. Um <laughs> Which apparently causes it to explode. explode. I, I, how many times have we all, just as human beings, not even the three of us, as human beings in general, have spilled some sort of beverage <laughs> on or near a computer? And has it, have they ever exploded <laughs> at any I'm just, point? I'm just imagining like those elementary schools where people were playing word munch, sitting in front of those bombs, not knowing them as children. <laughs> <laughs> Just like, I'm learning how to read. Oh, no. Miss I mean, Williams I, had water. <laughs> yeah, I, I think I think the first time that a computer would have exploded from contact with liquid, they would have been immediately taken off the market. <laughs> yeah. These are I, unsafe for human consumption. I, we like to think that, but in America, would they have? <laughs> would they yeah, have that's true. <laughs> that's true. <laughs> And then you would have some dipshit complain like they're trying to take away our computer monitors. <laughs> I uh, want to be I I want to have the freedom to spill water on my computer and get a piece of glass lodged in my throat. <laughs> oh, America. <laughs> oh. Okay, so then we cut back to Claire's house, and she's very worried, and she sees that the FBI is outside, and she walks into another room. And over her shoulder, you see this thing on top of a dresser that appears to be a lamp with two little figurines wearing, uh, I apologize for this up front, rice paddy hats sitting next to a giant chest. I know it's, it's, it's racist. Art, I just don't Patrick. know what flavor of racist it is. <laughs> it's, it's so many kinds of racism. It's like, <laughs> it's like a kaleidoscope of racism. It, it really was... Is. What's I to look at? Like, well, you know, you if you it's the type of thing where if you ask clear, like, you know, what you know, what the fuck is this? Why do you have this? So it'd be like, oh, uh, my grandfather brought it back from the war. Yeah. <laughs> <You know? Right>? <laughs> <laughs> it's all I have to remember my dad by. And it's like, well, maybe you should get a pack of cigarettes and yeah. <laughs> <laughs> consider smoking, but don't have too many around. 
<laughs> Listen. Uh, fine. So, yeah, uh, she ends up uh, going out to the FBI, and, and as Sheree noted earlier, completely ratting out the person she now refers to as baby. Well, <laughs> yeah, you can't get you, you can't get over that. Can you? <laughs> no, I really can't. It's everything so else in this wild. everything else in this movie is perfectly plausible, and, and <laughs> you know you you heard about a guy this happened to, but she just starts calling a baby. And it's like <laughs> I don't buy that. <laughs> I, I just don't. That's ridiculous. Sorry. I can I, the computer exploding. I can handle the piece of metal shearing someone's head off. Fine. Her just out of nowhere referring to him as as baby, as if they have a romantic relationship, is just a, a step. Uh, see if far. I see if I call you any any affectionate nicknames. <laughs> Start calling you Mister Hamilton, so we keep it real fucking formal here. <laughs> it's the it, only way we can be sure, Gina. It was very much like I guess I'll get a boyfriend out of this tragedy. <laughs> He's not paying attention. He's yeah, never it's, like um. It's not so bad. I got this cute dude to go out with me. Right? She's like, people died. He won't notice. No. And <laughs> they, can, they can wear the same clothes because they're big enough for both of them. <laughs> um, but uh, we cut back to the cabin and we see Alex reading the headlines of the newspaper he's crumpling up. And one of it is about how uh, a, that a teen is sought in the death of uh, Ms. Uh, Luton. And right next to it, <laughs> was the headline and i quote top officials investigated <laughs> i love headline i love newspaper headlines and movies this is the, the dumbest thing it's so badly typeset it just it doesn't look like anyone gave it any second look they're like just throw something in front of the camera but of course tomorrow's paper will read Unarmed teen escapes FBI in canoe because that's exactly what he does. When he gets in the canoe, it's so Joey leaving Dawson's house, and the cops were like, "Oh no, he's in water!" Oh but- shit! Like he's he's made it three meters into the shallow lake with a canoe. Let's get back in the car, everyone. <laughs> right? I'm like, this is not like a high speed boat chase. You can easily walk over and be like, "Hey, Alex." Come on, we're leaving. Oh no, he's slowly getting away. (laughs) (laughs) He's practically gone. What are we going to do? We're only motorized vehicles. If I get my pants wet again, my wife's going to kill me. So we're just going to (laughs) like catch him on the other side. (laughs) Oh boy. Um, So we uh, cut back to Claire's house. Uh, where the again the wind picks up. The, I I don't think as this goes on that the wind is as heavily involved in everything. But in this first movie, they're like, uh, "How are we gonna personify death?" They're like, "A breeze? Would a breeze work?" And they're like, "Okay, everything's a breeze." But here, the wind's very inconsistent. Where outside, it barely moves your hair, but it lifts up that laundry hanger right out of the ground. I was going to say, actually, death sounds pretty peaceful, honestly. <laughs> no, death is like a nice night that you would like to have a glass of red wine while enjoying, or it could murder you. You just don't know which one it's going to be. Is death a cat? <laughs> <What>? <laughs> I mean, yes and no. It's all of those things and more. <laughs> um, so her, her death has a lot of components to it and most of them are rather unsuccessful there's the wind knocks off a, a branch knocks a live electrical wire off of a pole and then part of it gets tangled up in a laundry rack that's spinning because of this wind the fucking but there's laundry, also ch- just do, just don't do laundry anymore <laughs> don't do laundry <laughs> don't because do you, will, you will it will somehow lead to your demise Yeah, well, I mean, was rain in the forecast? There's not a lot of clothes left on that, or they all spun off considering how fast it's spinning. But there's also a dog chained up outside. So you got to save the dog. So when the laundry pole hits an above ground pool, well, there's no safe above ground pool in my mind. Every time you see an above ground pool in a horror movie, shit's about to go off. That's true. Yes. yes. They're, they're just inherently unsafe. But so the laundry rack 
opens up the out above ground pool to the point where all the water splashes out and then the live electrical wire hits that and explodes but doesn't like no one's really hurt in that one because the dog has run off and clear has climbed onto the trellis of her house. So she then goes to the garage where she gets into a 1982 Olds Cutlass by the looks of it and <laughs> tries, which is a death trap. And <laughs> it tries to drive out, but the, the, the electric, the electricity is out because all of it's in loose electrical wires. Are there two? Are there 14? How many loose electrical wires are in the sequence? <laughs> all of them. <laughs> everyone. Because <laughs> the, out the back, out the front, like she's being confronted by everything. She tries to reverse out of this, but then go, but goes through the, the front door. Uh, okay. <laughs> and then, and then gets stuck on on a, the metal, uh, I don't know what is the thing that uh, that uh, the tracking beam that runs the the chain that raises your door that la- latches onto the front of the car so she can't back up anymore. But when she does manage to get out of that, it pulls a bunch of metal pipes over, and one of them hits the the uh, t- a can of turpentine. Then Alex, which is, appara- which, which is apparently what what Ms. Luton was drinking before, yes. before yeah. her, her house caught fire. Full Anything circle to take the pain away. <laughs> so that that is happening. Meanwhile, Alex is now fighting a live electrical wire with a metal shovel. Always a good idea. <laughs> Always a good idea. <laughs> Not a bright boy. It is a miracle that, that, that Alex is about to avoid death several times now. Yes. I mean, we have talked about some smart, you know, people in horror movies and some truly dumb ones. Here's a person who knows he's in a movie where he is supposed to die. Like, that's the whole concept of this. He's, he's cognizant of it enough to know that tetanus might kill him, and he needs to uh, gaff tape baby dolls against the wall but here he's like oh that electrical wire that's live let me make contact with it with metal and somehow when he does it 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 superpowers the shuffle it becomes the flash and it flies into the garage where it hits the propane tank for the the torch that that claire was using earlier that rockets underneath the car and now everything's on fire with propane underneath it. And he's like, hold on, honey bunches of oats. I'm going to grab this wire. And once I do, you'll only have a small amount of time to get out of this car that's about to blow up. Why don't you find another thing to hit the fucking wire with? Why does he grab it with his goddamn hands, Gina? Well, I think he's trying to do some sort of, you know, okay, now I'm ready, Des. <laughs> <laughs> It's just he's a beautiful dummy. Just fucking rocks <laughs> this one. Uh, there's gotta there's gotta be a, a better way than him grabbing the wire. Why not try to knock it out of the way? Why hold on to it like a fucking dum dum? But he does, and then he back to the futures all the way into the garage. Um like he's he he turned up the amp on his massive rock guitar too loud, and luckily the FBI is there to eventually administer a CPR, but they take a long time getting to it. Like for some reason, no wants to no one wants to put breath in his fucking lungs. It's like they maybe like, we should just kind of you know kind of stand over here and wait to see what happens. <laughs> Right. It's like clearly clear has this. So we're yes. just gonna <laughs> wait. I guess I missed the one part where where Clear has been is off on the side and she goes, Oh, Alex. And the and both the two FBI agents show up like a day late dollar short and, and almost try to gang tackle her when she moves out of the way. That's a real w- weird move. Like, are they shielding her from something? I, I don't understand that part. I mean, they've been ineffective the whole movie, so I think they were just getting in the way one last time. Yeah. <laughs> really? So fade out a white hallway and 
lo and behold, six months later. That's right. It's not just for Lifetime movies anymore. It's now for this. And six months later, we're in, where are we? Is this France? Is this supposed to be France? Yeah. yeah. It's the Paris trip. Uh, they, they went ahead and got back on that plane, which, you know what, if I survived a plane crash, ain't no fucking way I'm getting back on a plane yeah. ever, ever, Damn. ever again. I would I was, be grounded for life. <laughs> I was very much hoping that this was Little Europe from the Universal Studios back lot. It is not. It's someplace in Vancouver. But one angle had me thinking, ooh, are we in Hardy Boys territory? But no, no, no. This is the different uh, little thing. So the three of them are there, the best of pals, because they've lived through this. Um, because it's Europe, everyone is drinking, and they're over 18, I guess. Uh, and so Alex takes this time to go, you know, there's one thing about the way we escaped death that's rubbing me the wrong way. And that's where you punch him out. You don't wait for another syllable. You just punch him straight in the in the face and go, shut up. You just shut the fuck up. Because he brings this shit up. And then lo and behold, everyone's looking around and seeing buses and windows and looking at a guy delivering, you know, fresh hot meat and, and bolts are falling off the sides of buildings. And you're like, the fuck is going on? And Alex almost dies by another bus. And then the bus hits a pole. The pole spins up and hits a sign. And then the sign, which, by the way, contains 180 in it. So when, Oh, shit. When it misses them the <laughs> well, first you, time. You missed the, miss the, uh, the, the waiter singing Rocky Mountain High in French. Oh, yeah, that's which true. Yes. I love that. <laughs> that's when he knew death was upon them. He was like, like, oh, no. Oh, shit. You, you got a loose Belgian in there uh, singing um, Rocky Mountain High. Um, again, thank you, Belgium, for making us uh, number five on the charts there. Yet again, we, we there's someone in Belgium who loves the fuck out of this show, and I don't know who you are, but keep it up. <laughs> um, the, the pole hits the sign, the sign swings, and Carter, uh, I, it, Carter saves Alex and then stands up and is like, see, I saved you, death skips me. I'm immortal. And then the sign swings back around and fade to black. Don't, don't ever say I'm immortal. Right. Yeah, for you, 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 I mean, I, I was very, when I got sick last year and almost died, I, I have made jokes about how I can never die, mm -hmm. but I'm not like, yeah, that's right. Fuck you, death. You can't get me. Because <laughs> <You know? Yeah. laughs> that that's how, that's that how a meteor suddenly comes crashing through your, the, <laughs> the roof of your house. It, that was him giving us very big I'll be right back energy. Exactly. Mm -hmm. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yes. The I'm going to live forever is 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 this franchise's I'll be right back. That's absolutely for sure. Uh so that just about does it for Final Destination, our first film in the franchise. But of course, we can't say goodbye without saying how we would say goodbye. Uh, let's choose our own death venture where of the deaths in this section of the movie, if you were forced to die in one of those ways, which way would it be and why up for bid? We have a long series of events that eventually lead to a knife in your sternum um, and drinking grain alcohol. Or you can have a loose piece of metal spin out from underneath the train and decapitate you from the jawline up. It, it's literally like it. one half of his jaw is with his head and the rest of it's with his body. Or you can uh, have a sign kill you. It's really only three, right? Yeah, yeah. I, I would assume that it just kind of yeah, blams him. Yes, he's blamed. So, yeah. uh, Sheree, you are our, our, our wonderful guest here. And, of course, that means that you are chosen to go first. <laughs> I'm going to take the side. I think Carter had a pretty sweet deal. <laughs> he really doesn't see it coming. Like the last thing that goes through his mind is a light bulb. <laughs> Literally. Yeah. He also, it could have been so avoided had he not stood up. But this precious baby in the tight t-shirts was like, you know what I'm going to do? Stand up. I'm Kerr Smith. <laughs> do you think maybe the t-shirt is so tight that it's cutting off vital blood to his brain? And maybe that he would outthink it then? I could see that actually. <laughs> 
I could see that. Um, yeah, so I think I'm going to take that one. Okay. Now, this does mean you're going to have to travel internationally. So before you die, you're going to spend at least seven hours on a flight? Ooh. I mean, I actually, I got to go to Paris. Well, I got to go to France right before the pandemic shut everything down. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, it's a long flight, but worth it. Okay. Yeah, I agree with you. Uh, but I flew out of L.A., so it took me a shit ton longer. Um, yeah. All right, Gina, what say you? Now, you know, am I choosing what kind I want or what kind I feel would happen to me? That is always a question for you, Gina, and you have to follow your heart's desires. Because I think that I I would totally hit the, the Val Luton. I, I, I get to see a number of ridiculous things happening to me <laughs> that would end in my pulling down a knife on me. Mm-hmm. That that's so that just seems very very on brand for me. But if I could choose, I would want to. I would want to go out. I I too would want to get bland by a sign, mm-hmm. because as I always as I always say in these situations, I prefer the death I don't see coming. <laughs> and you know that that probably hit him and you know flanked him into a side of a building or something, and and he didn't even know what hit him. Yeah, yeah. Um, well. I, you know, I, I'm similar in a lot of respects, but I think I'm going to go with Billy Hitchcock because that's also a death he does not see coming. It just, <laughs> he, it slices off his head and then he's bye-bye, good night. Like, maybe there's 10 seconds where blood's still flowing to his eyeballs and he's like, why can't I move? And then and he's clicked out. Um, but I mean, at you least don't, I you, will have gotten some cool snacks before that happens. You don't, I mean, you probably aren't going to get a uh, an open casket, though. I mean, unless no. they unless they stitch the top of the head back on, you've got like some like Joker <laughs> scars in the uh, in the side of your face. And then even then, wouldn't these bodies just due to the the properties of everything they've gone through? Like this ends up how people you know are on coffin flop. <laughs> I really hope that Tony. I really hope that Tony Todd's character gets help in that morgue because this was a busy week. Yeah, yeah. Like if ever there was a time for dead bodies hitting pavement through shit wood, it would be after all of this. That's what I'm thinking. Um, But you know, call Corn Cob TV and tell them you still want Cough and Flop on the air. Otherwise fuck these people um before we get into plugs of course there's two people that we need to club uh, do to club <laughs> <laughs> with any loose object we have there's two people we need to plug and that is josh hollis does all our artwork go to joshhollis.com and of course our theme music is by uh, revenge body uh the fur the full length version of our music can be found at revengebodymemphis.bandcamp.com do it today. Sheree, where can people hear, see, and read more from you? Awesome. Um, for my personal shenanigans, you can follow me on Twitter and Instagram at Miss Sheree. That's M-I-S-S-S-H-A-R-A-I. Mm-hmm. For my podcast, A Nightmare on Fierce Street, you can follow us on Twitter at Nightmare Fierce or Instagram at A Nightmare on Fierce Street where we are up to shenanigans together about horror movies as well. <laughs> yes. And it's a very fun podcast and you guys have great chemistry. It's, it's a really a good show and people should check it out and read your, I think the stuff you're doing on Dread Central is really fun to read as well. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. It's been awesome. <laughs> yeah. Uh, hey, Gina, where can people find you on these here internets? I write about movies and television at the spool.net. Uh, by the time this goes live, I'll be, I'll with a written a retrospective on Wayne's world, which somehow <laughs> yeah. implausibly brace yourself, Patrick uh-huh. turns 30 years old oh, this <gasps> month. And that's that that is 30 years old (laughs) wayne's world i am dust i i my a ghost has left my fucking body i i I have to lift my long white beard off my computer (laughs) keyboard to write this article but it, it will get written uh and i am on twitter and instagram under gina does things that's g e n a does things do it today people check it out you of course can find us on all the socials and twitter and facebook and instagram just look up kill by kill podcast or kill by kill pod um and of course uh it, there's a uh 
we've had lots of giveaways. Uh, you might want to email us, uh, killbykillpod at gmail.com. Uh, if you want to participate in that, um, there might be some left. You never know. And that just about does it. Uh, next week, we'll be back with more After Dark. And of course, after that, a mainline Kill by Kill pod uh, will be coming your way. Don't worry, folks. The, the body count will continue for myself and for Gina and Shirai. Bye-bye, everybody. Bye.